Hey guys, Sleepy Reader here. Wonder Woman versus Wonder Woman. Uh, I said maybe two and a half weeks ago or more that I was going to compare these two books. Kind of my reversal of the experiment Howler Mouse did where he did his yesterday versus yesteryear where he compared some recent Avengers and recent Justice League to early 80s I think Avengers and Justice League and found the early ones you know a much better value for your dollar uh, richer stories a longer read etc uh, etc et um, and I got all excited by this and I wanted to kind of reverse the experiment and I pick and kind of uh, weigh the scales towards the present really because I picking m my favorite DC book right now um, I grabbed this collection from the library trying to decide whether I want to get the first six issues as a collection or dig up the um, the floppies because I'd read them digitally um, and so then I and I just randomly kind of randomly grabbed because it intrigued me this Diana Prince Wonder Woman from 1969 it's a collection of Denny O'Neill and Mike Sikowski comics uh, Denny O'Neill was the hot young Turk at the time who had revived Batman and revived Green Lantern and Green Arrow and they gave him Wonder Woman and he decided or they decided to get rid of her powers and make her kind of a a groovy young Emma Peel Avengers James Bond type of adventurer um, the first thing they did is she went out and got a makeover you know with new groovy clothes and started going to art galleries and parties late at night at cemeteries and things <laughs> Um, and I've the reason why it's taken me so long is I found this much harder to do than I thought it would be. Uh, maybe it's comparing such long things. As I was reading them, I thought I was having all these deep thoughts about the present versus the past, and it's it's an issue that means a lot to me because comics are both nostalgic for me and an art form I really care about in its in all its um, in all its different stages in all its different guises so um, but I felt that one of the things that was kind of missing from Howler Mouse I mean I'm sure he knew it was the that the modern ones are written from the tr for the trade, so they're really a different beast, even though they're still monthly comic books that you can buy, well, not on a newsstand anymore, but that you can buy, you can pick up one at a time, that these ones are written for a trade, and these ones aren't. And it was, it was quite a grind, I have to say, to work my way through these Wonder Womans. The, the first issue was really terrible, you know, with a really stupid mystery and a really stupid solution to it, and full of uh, fake groovy language that, that you could tell was not the real language of the young hip people of the day. Um, these do have beautiful covers. And uh, in the second issue of the series, Denny O'Neill actually t gets rid of Diana Prince's powers and uh, it's all done in a two-page scene where she goes to Paradise Island, learns they're moving to another dimension, and she has a choice of leaving with them or staying in, on Earth on Steve Trevor's, in Steve Trevor's world and losing her powers. Steve Trevor, of course, is in great danger, having gone undercover to infiltrate uh, Dr. Cyber's organization, so she wants to stay in the real world to help save him. You can see Paradise Island is just done as a little brown blob in the blue ocean. Um, we, we see almost nothing of the island and the Amazons and what their world is like. This what I think in a modern comic this would be a big scene that would take many pages, maybe even half a half an issue or something. Imagine, you know, this magic island fading away into another dimension and Wonder Girl leaving behind everything, you know, her family, her home, uh, forever, she thinks, and losing her powers, which is her main identity. Um, 
Instead, we don't even see the island fade away. We just see that it's been miscolored, or the ocean around it's been miscolored. We get a few tears, and then she's off on her, adven her next adventure, which is getting an apartment, and within two pages, meeting an Asian mentor who's going to teach her kung fu. He's blind and knows that she needs training. It's kind of like, I don't know how many of you have read uh, Frank Miller's classic Daredevil run, but it's kind of like Daredevil's mentor, Stick, uh, which I did make the connection since this was written by Denny O'Neill, and Denny O'Neill was, was Frank Miller's editor on Daredevil. I wonder if that in some way was an homage to, to this. Of course, the I guess the Asian mentor you find in a lot of places. This one is blind. And of course, in a few days, she's ready for action, starting to fight Dr. Cyber's men. Every issue is really dense, but it can be kind of frustrating to go through. Um, as I started reading more and more of it, I began to get into it a bit more. Um, and the art stopped bothering me so much. My first reaction to the art is it reminded me of drawings in fashion catalogs that they used to have when I was a kid. Um, back when they didn't always use photographs in fashion catalogs, maybe it was too expensive. And they had these kind of slick but very bland artist drawings of women in clothing. And that's, that's kind of the style of Mike Sikowski. He must be a very good artist in the sense of doing the human figure perfectly all the time but in a style that to me is totally uninteresting. It completely reminded me of, of when I was a kid, you know, DC versus Marvel. This, this reminded me of how I would read DC comics at the time, not in 1969, because I wasn't reading comics then, but you know, five years later, uh, read, or read DC comics and be very disappointed and then read Marvel comics and be very excited. And, you know, at that time my focus was on the art and the art certainly doesn't pop and just has a blandness here. Um, so what we get is issue after issue of them almost finding Dr. Cyber and then Dr. Cyber getting away. Eventually it's revealed who Dr. Cyber is and she's a woman and, um, and that might have been quite startling back then to have your supervillain be a woman. There, all the covers are really great, even though I don't seem to like the interior art. I'm very impressed by all the covers. As I, as I read along, I got more used to the art. Um, they pack a whole bunch of story in here, but, but the emotions just sort of pop out of nowhere and then go away again. Steve Trevor appears, and then they forget about him. She starts having other f feelings for other men. Steve Trevor might be dead. He might not be. No one ever asks questions about that. Um, even though the whole goal originally was to help Steve Trevor, he gets pretty much forgotten. Um, but yeah, as I went along, I enjoyed it. I enjoyed it more. Um, I got used to the art. I got used to the lack of emotional connection. And there was, there was just something, there was something fun about it. Um, when Mike Sikowski takes over the writing, I, I really didn't notice the difference. I thought there'd be a huge difference. But in his last two issues, Mike, the Mike Sikowski written issues, we do go back to Paradise Island and we get a story involving gods and finding heroes from the past to help the Amazons fight the gods. Um, there is, there is Ares. And he wants the secret of um, traveling through dimensions from the Amazon so he can return to Earth and conquer Earth. So all of this is okay. I mean, I kind of like the mythological stuff, but again, told in both a slow way and yet a hasty way. Um, and, and, yeah, so... In the end, it was okay, and you definitely, you're reading stuff, and it, it just becomes very apparent with the frustration you feel reading it. You're reading stuff that was not meant to be collected, and was not, it was meant to be read probably once, 
and then half forgotten and then maybe you would read another issue or maybe you wouldn't. I was surprised that the storyline, that there was a long through line. Their stories were not completed. The whole chasing after Dr. Cyber is not finished in this volume. I assume they're going to get back to it. Um, so anyhow, it's interesting the, the difference in the idea, ideal woman, perhaps, then and now. Um, quite a bit more flesh showing now, but also quite a bit more muscular and sort of, what's the right word for it? Uh, she seems more untouchable. This, this Wonder Woman seems more untouchable. Not a girl you could meet somewhere and have, you know, another teenage girl like you if you were a teenage boy re reading reading it. So I think at the time this was a noble experiment. Um, and Denny O'Neill had a lot of good ideas here, but it was all hastily done. And um, and they I think they were aiming towards an older audience but didn't quite have a grasp on that older audience yet. Um, so they were probably leaving behind their younger audience a bit too much, but not reaching the older audience yet. This Wonder Woman um, has artwork that, you know, that combines the art and the color magnificently. I think a, a lot goes to the colorist and a lot also goes to the artist who I think knows how to work with colorists. Um, who leaves a lot of space for the colorist and knows what the colorist is going to do, and I think I don't know if it's just artists, uh, just covers, but they show us the black and white versions of all the covers, and I notice they all have a gray wash on them, and I think the gray wash, to an extent, guides the colorist in making making choices of gradations of light on the figures and on in the whole scene. So. There's another black and white cover. So I think artists are working in an entirely different way. They're, they're working very closely with colorists. Digital colorists who do their job right can get beautiful effects. Sometimes I hate digital colorists. They overwhelm the artwork. Um, sometimes they, uh, they add too many Photoshop effects, or maybe it's the artist adding the Photoshop effects. but. Here, I think the modern comic book is done just right um, with, with uh, the colors used to, to perfect effect. The, um, the art also goes really well with the thematic, mythic structure of it, especially the Cliff Chang art. The Tony Aikens art is a little different, a little less mythic but still works very well. And maybe doesn't work quite as well with the coloring either. Uh, Tony Akins may not be an artist who spends as much time thinking about, I'm trying to, but there's still, he's still a very good artist. And I feel like he got even better as Wonder Woman moved along. You know, I love the way Neptune looks. That's another thing. We get all kinds of <clears throat> imaginative, creative takes on mythological things. Not, not the first easy thing you would think about of what a god looks like. For instance, here is, whoops, here is Ares, the god of, whoops, Ares, the god of war. There's Apollo. We get a very different look. Uh, a lot of thought has gone into this. The other big difference that is really noticeable when you, uh, art-wise, when you compare then and now, is how cinematic the now is. Um, a lot of these scenes, and this is a bit, you know, possibly a bad thing. A lot of these pictures seem like, um, what do they call them? Uh, late night, brain not working. Maybe more beer will help. They seem like those pictures that people draw from movies. <laughs> Damn. Um, yeah, wish my brain worked as well as Howler Mouse's. This whole page seems like a series of storyboards there. 
if you can see that. Um, scene after scene after scene, sort of the key shots that you might do with no words there. And uh, so here is the storyboard aspect. You know, it's good to bring in the influence of movies, and that goes back to the early comic book artists brought in the influence of movies, although they were more influenced by what the comic strip artists did and what other, uh, other illustrative... Their, their influences were more from other illustrative art um, and fine art and other things like that. And now the movie influence is really big. And, and the downside of, of that movie influence is you are a bit more of a slave to the image and you discount the word a little too much. Words help us move through the comic book and too many, for me, too many wordless pages, even though there's lots of information in those wordless pages, makes me read too quickly and I miss things. And, and there's plenty of scenes where the characters seem too um, too stoic. They don't say enough. It's, it's almost unrealistic how little they say and how little they discuss things. And, and there's a, at, the, at the end of this volume, there's a big um, trick that they play on the gods. And I only half understand the trick. It's not fully explained uh, what the plan was, how it really worked out. I have a general outline of it, and it seems pretty clever. But it would have been nice if they explained it a little bit more. Um, there's nothing. There's nothing in this old Wonder Woman that I don't understand. It's all explained to me in the end. Sometimes that's it's it's dumb stuff. It's explained. You can tell the ideas that they came up with were the first idea that came into their mind. They didn't work as hard on their ideas as they do as they do now. Um, but another thing, which is part of their hard work, but there are scenes on the very first two pages of this, just as an example of this volume from issue one of the new Wonder Woman. These first two pages, they don't really pay off until issue 12. And I think there's things in those two pages that are going to continue to pay off through issue 24, as a guess. And... Well, that's, that's really cool if you read all 24 issues. I think it's a little bit crazy. It's a little bit going too far. Uh, only the most obsessive person who, who remembers and reads back everything is going to get all the connections if these authors and artists remember it themselves and keep all the threads going. I don't see... It's, it was a bit of a trap to have to kind of wrap everything up in one issue here. But I don't see why they can't do stories that really wrap up in six issues. Um, the, the comic books seem to have gone too far in this direction of endless loose ends and stories that never really end. There's something very cool about that, but it's also almost too much. There needs to be more stopping points. Uh, going back maybe to the 80s, the first time I was aware of comic books where they were clearly r regularly written to be like six issue arcs was Sandman with Neil Gaiman. And I would collect the story before I realized I could just buy the trades. I would collect the story. I would collect all the issues of A Game of You. And then I would read it. Um, but even those, those ended after six issues. Yes. There was a continuing, a whole arc about Sandman overall, but those were complete stories. And now uh, things have progressed to the point where nothing seems to have complete stories, or very little has complete stories. And it's a little bit, it's a little bit insane. And I think it particularly insane because I think it drives away new readers. You should be able to pick up, you should be able to pay $25 for a volume of Wonder Woman and get a whole story. Um... I looked, these issues were 12 and 15 cents. I, I went to a website uh, to see what the value of 15 cents was now, and it spits out like five different values. But the value I took away with it was what you, could bu what you could have bought for 15 cents back then that you could buy for now. So the purchasing power of 15 cents 
um, would now equal the purchasing power of a dollar eighty. Uh, these individual comics actually cost three dollars, so we are paying a lot more, but we are getting. I think we're getting more craftspeople working on it, uh, particularly the colorist, as I've been talking about. Uh, a lot more work goes into the color of these. And I think in some cases we're getting artists who, who really uh, sweat blood into these pictures and spend a lot of time on them. But you do have to ask yourself, in some comics where there's endless spreads and splashes, if they're, even though those are beautiful spreads and splashes, if they're really doing more work than artists who did all these panels. Um, because a lot of the work is figuring out what's going to go in the panel. The, the extra detail and stuff may take time, but it, it's kind of the easier work, I think, of the artist compared to the, the basic structures of things um, and the storytelling, figuring out the, the puzzles of the storytelling. However, Wonder Woman is not guilty of that. There are some bigger spreads, but there are very few two-page spreads, and there's lots of meaty pages with lots of panels. Um, so not all modern comics waste all their space. Um, and when it does, you know, even pages like these are really cool, really beautifully laid out, um, and have a lot going on. I, I do just object. I object to pages and pages without words. Every now and then it has a nice effect, but when you do too many, and again, Wonder Woman is not nearly as guilty of this as a lot of books. <clears throat> so, as you can tell, overall, I like the modern Wonder Woman much better. However, what if I had compared it to the Wonder Woman of... Uh, George Perez era in the 80s, or I think it was the 80s or 90s, or when John Byrne did Wonder Woman, or some other really, I think Gail, did Gail Simone do Wonder Woman at one point? Of course, that's not so long ago. So this just happens to be one comparison that, you know, came my way. I might, you know, given a lot of time, I might, this, there's many more volumes of this. I think there's three or four volumes of this Diana Prince series. I might read more of them. I get a little bit of a nostalgic kick. Um, there's interesting things that they're doing. It's also an interesting cultural view of a, of a different time. Uh, you know, when, when the actual 60s were happening, I was not aware of them. But by the 70s, I was aware of their shadows. Um, I think uh, I think uh, Howler Mouse. I keep quoting Howler Mouse. Uh, I should bow at the altar of Howler Mouse. I think Howler Mouse uh, called the '70s the hangover of the '60s. Um, I'm sure other people have said that, so I shouldn't credit you so much, Howler Mouse. But uh, okay, yeah, disorganized thoughts. So yeah, it would be nice. I, I would like to see more variety in modern comics. It's like everyone does things the same way. There's no thought balloons. They um, all use this kind of cinematic effects. It's almost, you almost get the feeling that they would, they're too cool to give you too much information. They've got to be minimal. Um, maybe th their fellow writers or fellow comic book insiders would, would sneer at them if, if they did things a different way. But, you know, taking the good with the bad and given that I have enough money to spend on more expensive comics, maybe, you know, for me, it's actually okay that I just spend more money and I get a better comic book overall. If I, especially if I read them in, in a group. James, no, not James. Uh, Mr. I Talk Apple had a really good video where he talks about 
approaches for newer readers to, to for going back and reading the quote classic comics and so I'll, I'll put a link to that video down here um, I think he had a lot of good thoughts I think uh, younger readers when they read first read comics are gonna get trades almost in most cases unless they've got dads with lots of comics that they're willing to let little kids get their grubby hands on um, which is tricky because my daughter destroys comic books when she touches them. But in any case, uh, even if they're going to read the old ones, most of them are going to get in trades. My nephews and nieces have gotten lots of old trades from me. And as I've said elsewhere, they didn't even know individual comics come out anymore. So it's just a, a fact of life. And if you read these, these old comics in collections they it takes a shifting of the brain you you really maybe should read one issue wait a week then read another issue something like that um because they aren't designed to be read all together and and if you compare them to uh modern graphic novels that are designed that way when you when you encounter comics first this way the new ones are going to seem a lot better for the most part to most of us But if you get deeper into it, there are a lot of good things that have been lost or, you know, aren't as much of a focus anymore. And lots of uh, great artists, some good writers. I think in the past there were more, more, um, more good art. The, the good artists were in higher ratio to the good writers. Uh, writing was not valued and and usually I think you still get your right people get writing jobs through being good at networking and making connections but back then it was like whoever's around the office writes this comic book practically um, and that's an exaggeration but that was also true in in some cases so uh, I hope this wasn't too much of a horrible muddle and I have the whole issue of new comics versus old comics milling around in my head, and I'm sure it'll come up other times when I talk about comic books. And I hope you're all having a fun time reading comic books, watching videos, trying to keep up with all your videos. It seems like there's more and more people putting up videos, and that's great. Uh, I personally, uh, I'll, if I have too many videos to watch I'll, I'll skip the halls and watch the reviews or the, the thought pieces and the rants and stuff like that but that's just me uh, and I like what everyone's doing uh, one way or the other so cheers talk to you later